I don't know if I uh, if I studied too much, just put too much material together. I ho certainly hope I haven't been rambling. <laughs> but today we're going to pick up where we left off uh, talking about Elijah and um, how that Elijah slipped into a state of deep depression right after a great victory for God. And um, just a quick synapse, or a quick summary. Um, Elijah went before all the people of Israel and he challenged the prophets of Baal, which is a false god. And he said, okay, you guys make an altar, offer up a bullock on your altar, pray to your god. I'll make an altar, put a bullock on it. I'll pray to the real god, and we'll see whose offering gets accepted. And, of course, we know that uh, the prophets of Baal, uh, all day long they tried and tried while Elijah made fun of them and told them things like, well, you've got to yell harder or yell louder, or scream harder, do more. Your God must be on vacation. He must be asleep. Uh, and he gave them all day long. Nothing happened. He prayed a simple prayer to God and fire came out of heaven, devoured the sacrifice that was prepared, the bullock, the altar, all the water that was poured upon it. And just a great, great victory because he, he told the people, now determine who you are going to serve. Are you going to serve the real true God or are you going to serve Baal and go along with the rest of the people in the world in serving idols and false gods. And he won many people to the Lord that day. Well, then it happened that Jezebel, who had power and influence in that society, told him that she was going to make sure that he was dead by the next day. If he wasn't dead, then she would be dead. And uh, this filled him with stress and fear and anxiety. And when that happened, he did the first thing that most of us try to do when we when stress and anxiety and fear comes into our life. He tried to run away from it. But when real depression comes into our life, there's no way to run away from it because it's not rational according to the Word of God. According to the Word of God, we should not have to deal with deep clinical depression for any length of time. Okay? We will have our occasions of sadness. We will have our times of depression. But not that we should have to deal with them for any length of time. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that we, as God's children, we live by faith and not by sight. So, if, you know, right now... Uh, We've all been through, been through some tribulations this past couple of years. And uh, right now in, the, in my life, in the life of my family members, uh, here throughout California, there's, there's a lot of things going on. I've had three deaths this year, uh, three near misses. Uh, it's just been a stress and a strain on the family. 
and um, I'm preaching this sermon as much to myself as I am to anybody else. Because you cannot control, as a human being, you cannot control what thoughts or emotions pop up inside of you. Without God's help, it is impossible to control the thoughts or emotions that are the result of daily living. And that's where we need the Word of God. That's where we need more faith. We need to be built up. And, uh, you know, oftentimes when someone is depressed, people will say, you know, it's been this long, stop being silly, just get over it. But it's not that easy. Because... As a human being, you have virtually no control over what thoughts jump into your head. You have virtually no control over what emotions are going to, to jump into your heart. But what you do have control over is how you allow God to help you with His Word. And remember, what is God's Word? God's Word is the spoken Word from the Father. It is the Word that was made flesh and dwelt among us in Jesus Christ. And it is the Word of God in the person of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us. And the Bible says that uh, we can ultimately gain self-control Excuse me, over what we think and what we feel, we can ultimately gain control over those things if we will, by faith, rely on God's Word. And how do we gain faith? The Bible says that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. And the Bible also says, how shall people hear unless someone preaches to them, unless someone tells them? So, We've already talked about depression and uh, anything from mild to clinical, uh, that it is actually a perverted or an inaccurate view of who you are, where you're at, and what your circumstance really is as a child of God. If you're not a child of God, go ahead and be depressed because... You're in a terrible situation. Okay? You have no hope. You have no eternal hope. But if you are a born-again believer and you have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, you have been adopted into God's family, then there is no reason for us to stay in depression, even though it's sometimes easy to fall into depression. It's not easy to crawl back out. But God gives us specific steps in order to help us crawl out of our sadness or depression, whatever you want to call it, however deep that you think it is. And um, it's a matter of perception, and, and that reminds me of a, a joke that I came across. There was a... Uh, in a psychiatrist's waiting room, there was some people there in the waiting room, and uh, there was a, a woman and a man, and the woman asked the man, why such a long face? You look so depressed today. And the man said, nobody believes who I really am. No, my, nobody will believe who I really am. And he says, my wife won't believe it. Even my doctor will not believe who I really am. And so the lady asked, well, who is it that you think you are? And he said, I am Napoleon Bonaparte. And she said to him, well, who told you that you are Napoleon Bonaparte? And he said, well, why God told me. 
and a patient from across the waiting room yelled out, I did not. It's a matter of perception to a certain degree. Now let's go back to Elijah. Elijah, we know the story, we know the background, talking about overcoming depression. This is what God did for Elijah. First of all, God fed him well. In verses 5 through 7 it says, Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So already now uh, we see that uh, something that science has figured out in the 21st century, that diet has a lot to do with how we feel, especially when we're under stress, especially when we're anxious. Diet has a lot to do with how we feel. And so God fed him, and God fed him that which would strengthen him for the purpose that God had planned for him. Just because we fall into sadness or depression or anxiety or doesn't ever mean that God, God changes his game plan for us. It doesn't mean that we get out from under what our purpose is. God still has a purpose and a plan for us. And so when we get, when we fall into the trap of depression and it seems like we just can't seem to get out, first of all, God's going to uh, give us that which we need to begin to come out of that, come out from under that depression. And um, so the first thing that he did for Elijah is the thing that he will do for us, and it's the thing that uh, we should advise people that we come into contact with, people that we minister to, especially our friends and our family. Uh, when they're dealing with depression and it's just so hard for them to crawl out of it, we should advise them to eat well to change their diet, even if it's just for a while, to eat more healthy. And, um, of course, in the Bible, if you study much about diet in the Bible, uh, you understand that whole grains, especially whole grain breads and fish, were the staple. For God's children. For thousands of years. And those are still great dietary items for us today. Okay, the next thing that God did for Elijah. God let him rest a spell. Okay, we, in the world that we live in now, in a world that has such little focus and a lack of concentration, we are always ready for people and things to just move on. But when someone's dealing with depression, it's it doesn't happen right away. It doesn't happen. You can't just snap a finger and and get on with your life. So those people need a little time to rest. And that's what God allowed Elijah to do. Verse 5, then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, and so he ate and drank and lay down again in verse 6. So God allowed Elijah to have time to rest his body because his body was under a great deal of 
not only emotional stress, but a great deal of physical stress. The next thing that God did for Elijah, and that he'll also do for us, is he asked him some questions to get him out of that state of mind where he wasn't thinking realistically. You know, remember I said that depression, part of depression, is having a perverted view of what is real. Having an inaccurate view of what is real. We sometimes think that life has control over us. Well, as ordained priests and kings in the kingdom of God, we should have control over life. That's what's real. We should be the ones that are in control. If we lose that control, it's because we've lost our perspective and we've gone astray in our faith. So God asked Elijah some questions to help him think more realistically, to bring him back around. Verse 9, he said, And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? prompting him to think about his situation and, and how he got to be where he is. What are you doing here, Elijah? Remember, Elijah had this great success, this huge victory for the Lord and for himself. He had just won many hearts to the Lord and all the prophets of Baal had been killed and gotten rid of. They were no longer an influence in that society. And But here he is, scared, off hiding in the wilderness. And God asks him, what are you doing out here? Get him to think. What am I doing out here? God was with me and he did all these amazing things through me, all these miracles. Why am I hiding out here in caves, afraid of some woman, when God just gave me the victory over thousands and thousands of people? And God also asked him, verse 13, So it was when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out, and stood in the entrance of the cave, suddenly a voice came to him and said, Again, what are you doing here, Elijah? You know, we try to minister to the people around us, and we try to minister to especially our family members. Our family are the people that we're influenced by the most. Our our blood family, and our church family. Those two families are the families that we are influenced by the most. And so we so often try to give them advice, and we try to give them good opinions, and we try to help them through their times of crisis. And when we try to help people uh, out of depression, they don't need a bunch of our own selfish advice, our own self-righteous advice. They don't need a bunch of our opinions. They need faith. Faith that comes from the Word of God. They need to just be asked questions that will allow them to see what their reality really is. And the basic question is, what are you doing here? What brought you to this place where you're at? What do you think it is that brought you to this lowly estate? Right? Okay, next. Next thing that God did for Elijah to help him out of his depression God brought Elijah directly into his presence. The presence of God was revealed to Elijah. Verses 11 and 12. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. 
But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a still small voice. Now, we look at these verses and we see God did some amazing things to catch Elijah's attention. But what was it that actually spoke to Elijah's heart? God caused a great wind, a mighty earthquake, a great fire. But those things only caught Elijah's attention. They didn't actually penetrate into the mind and heart of Elijah to do him any good in bringing him out of his depression. The thing that worked was after all of that, that still small voice. And what is that still small voice? It's the Holy Spirit, right? The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come upon people from time to time as the need was there. But now, Jesus Christ, he promised us that once he left, he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and that the Comforter would live with us and within us until Jesus Christ returns again. So, we have the Holy Spirit with us always, constantly, and consistently. And it is that voice that if we will stop and listen to it, if it can get our attention, if God can get our attention and uh, allow us to finally start listening to that still small voice inside of us, that's when we'll really start to make a turnaround in our lives, whether we're dealing with simple sadness or clinical depression. Um, also, God's presence is the place of healing, insight, and power. When we stand in God's presence, that's the place of healing, insight, and power. You need to overcome anything in your life you need to be in the presence of God. You need to be in the presence of, you need to be in communication with the Father. You need to be in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Abide in Him and He abides in you. And you need to be paying attention to the Holy Spirit that dwells within. Because it is in the presence of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we find our place of healing, our place of insight as to what is real versus what's not real, and the power to overcome. Next, what God did for Elijah during his time of Great Depression, God told him the, the truth. Elijah was under a mistaken impression. He had a perverted view of his reality, but he was also under a mistaken impression. Anybody remember what that mistaken impression was? He was telling God, hey, I'm the only one left that's serving you. I'm the only one left that's telling people about you. I'm the only one left that's preaching your word. Verse 18, God revealed to him the truth of the situation. He said, Yet have I reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Elijah was griping to God, saying, I'm the only one out of all the thousands and thousands of people it seems like I'm all alone here in trying to accomplish your work and in trying to evangelize your nation. And God says to him, you're not alone, Elijah. 
I've reserved 7,000 people in Israel who have not bowed their knee to Baal and have not kissed the idol. You're not alone in this. People undergoing depression need to know they're not alone. And the other aspect is getting in touch with God is not about believing fairy tales. It's not about believism. It's about genuine faith. It's getting in touch with reality. Knowing what's real. That we as the children of God have equal inheritance with Jesus Christ. That means that we have power and authority over all things. And that we can speak things into existence. Oftentimes, that the situations in life which seem absolutely impossible are those perfect situations for God to do his greatest miracles. So getting in touch with God is not about believing in, in some kind of fairy tale. It's getting in touch with the reality of who we are and what power and authority that God has given us while we remain on this earth and until we move on into eternity. Uh, choose to believe the truth. No matter what Satan throws at us, no matter what life throws at us, no matter what the opinions of others are, Always choose to believe the truth of God's word because what you believe in your heart of hearts will determine much about how you feel. What you think and how you feel. How you feel emotionally has to do with what you truly have faith in. If you really have faith in God, then it's going to totally change how you view your situation. Okay? If you've lost your faith in God, then you'll be hiding in the corner saying, Oh, all is lost. Woe unto me. Somebody just hit me with a big stick and get it over with. But when you know in your heart of hearts the truth, and you have faith in your Redeemer. That will change your emotions and your thought patterns and bring you into the truth. Okay, and number six, the Lord, now here's where we get into some territory that I'm familiar with. The Lord gave him a job. Why am I familiar with this? Because growing up, my dad's cure for everything was work therapy. If you were sick with a cold, go out and mow the lawn, you'll feel better. If you had a broken arm, go out and wash the car. Get up here and wash the dishes. You'll feel a lot better. Whatever was wrong, it was kind of my dad's solution to most problems in life was you can work through it. Work therapy. And here God comes to Elijah and he gives him a job. Uh, verses 16, 15 and 16. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also ye shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So 
we know that Elisha followed Elijah in a lot of the miracles and the power that Elijah had. And that was because Elijah had taught him and apprenticed him. And um, so we see these steps that God took in bringing Elijah out of his depression. And the final step is to remember your place and purpose. as far as your profession is as a child of God. The Bible refers to our profession of faith. A lot of people take that as, um, you know, what you professed. The faith that I stated out of my mouth. In my mind, it goes one step further. It's the new profession that you have taken on when you, it's the new job you have taken when you accept Jesus Christ as Savior. When you accept Jesus Christ as Savior, you're given a new identity and a new job. It's like a, a massive relocation program. You're given a new identity, you're a new creature in Christ, and you're given a new purpose and plan for your life. And so... With this profession, we are now professional Christians. And as professional Christians, we should go forth and do that which God has commanded us to do. Here's my final statement on this subject. Your path to happiness involves responsibility. I want you to think about that statement and not just for a moment. I want you to think about that statement all this week. The path to your happiness involves responsibility. Your responsibility and greater responsibilities. If we're going to be happy in life, we're going to have to learn to desire to accept new responsibilities. And it's hard because we live in a world that wants to dodge responsibility for everything. Right? Especially uh, my, the generations that are my children and my grandchildren. They don't want to be accountable or responsible for anything. And they will find any excuse in order for us not to account them or not to consider them responsible for what they do. People go into court with such nonsense excuses. You know, I killed those 27 people because I was abused as a child. Well, that's not very responsible, and you're certainly not taking accountability for your own actions when you make those kinds of excuses for those kinds of actions. In order to get out of depression or just to get out of sadness, in order to keep that joy and happiness in our lives, the Lord, remember, the Lord has given us a job to do, and we have to accept that we are accountable to him for results, and those results involve the responsibilities, the extra responsibility that God has given to us as a Christian. And you have those extra responsibilities, whether you like it or not, whether you want them or not, they are given to each and every one of us. And we are going to have to someday stand before God and explain what we did with our life and why we did it. So, keeping that in mind, if we allow ourselves to be dragged down into the pit of clinical depression, for months 
or for some people years. At some point, we've got to stand before God and give an account. We'll either stand before God at the great, great white throne judgment, those who haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, those who have will stand before Christ to give an account of what we've done in our lives. I don't want to stand before God and try to make excuses about time I wasted being selfish and self-accommodating and self-righteous in my life. I want that to be the most joyous time that I ever experienced throughout eternity. When I finally stand before Christ and he says, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That is going to be the greatest day as long as I hold on to that which God gives us in times of great sadness or even great depression. So keep those uh, six things in mind. Let me go over them real quick before we close. I'll back up here. Number one, diet. These are the things that God did for Elijah to get him out of depression. Gave him a good diet. The next thing, let him rest. Third thing, ask him questions that brought him back into reality to help him think realistically. Number four, brought him into his very presence to give him the healing and insight and power he needed to get through. Number five, God told him the truth. He was believing some kind of... Uh, misconception, uh, something that wasn't quite accurate, God told him the exact truth, what, rea what reality he was actually living in. And then finally, the Lord reminded him what his job was and gave him a new task to go and accomplish. Actually, a few new tasks to go and accomplish. And when he went to accomplish those tasks, his happiness began to return to him. So if you're at a place in your life right now where your happiness, you just can't seem to get your happiness back, can't seem to get the joy back into your life, it's time to take these steps. Allow God to bring us out of our selfish misery and take those steps toward the job and the tasks that he has for us at hand. To take accountability and responsibility for our own lives so that we can stand before Christ with a clear conscience. And that's about all I have to say on the subject, so we're finished up with that. Let's stand together and we'll be this one. All right, any word this, this morning before we dismiss?